Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. Now, one of the components that I was tasked with owning when I worked on Windows was the auto-run functionality for CDs and USB sticks. It was a feature that would be targeted and exploited in a number of ways, from the Sony DRM rootkit to the Stuxnet cyber weapon. It's my own little personal connection to each of those attacks. Stuxnet relied on auto-run to jump the air gap at the Iranian nuclear facilities, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's go back to the beginning and explore the Stuxnet cyber weapon in detail. The story of Stuxnet begins in June 2010, when a relatively obscure security firm based in Belarus called Virus Block Ada received a curious report from one of their Iranian clients. The client was experiencing an unusual number of system crashes and blue screens. Symptoms that were new and that seemed to have no apparent cause. When the analysts at Virus Block Ada took a closer look, they found something that immediately caught their attention. A piece of malware exploiting a brand new zero-day vulnerability in Windows. Now, zero days are vulnerabilities that are unknown even to Microsoft, the software vendor, and by extension, they are completely unpatched and fully exposed. They're the holy grail for attackers because they offer a way into systems without triggering any existing alarms. But here's where things got a little weird. As the researchers dug deeper, they discovered that this malware wasn't just exploiting one zero day, it was exploiting four brand new ones. To put that in perspective, most cyber criminals consider themselves extremely lucky to have access to even a single zero day exploit. The use of four simultaneously suggested a level of resources and sophistication that pointed beyond common cyber crime. It strongly indicated a nation state actor, one with powerful cyber resources and a deep well of carefully guarded zero day exploits. As samples of the malware began circulating among cybersecurity firms worldwide, heavyweights like Symantec and Kaspersky Labs joined their investigations. They were astounded by what they found. The malware, which would later be named Stuxnet, which is a portmanteau derived from keywords found in its code, was unlike anything they had ever seen. Whereas analyzing a new piece of malware can often be done by a seasoned engineer before lunch, Stuxnet was no mere virus. It was so complex it would take researchers months of painstaking work just to establish a firm foothold on what it was capable of and how it worked. First off, the code base was enormous for malware, weighing in at about 500 kilobytes. It was written in multiple programming languages, including C, C++, and even some object-oriented code, which is atypical for malicious software. The complexity didn't stop there. Stuxnet employed advanced techniques like rootkit functionality in order to hide its presence on infected systems, and it could update itself and communicate with command and control servers via peer-to-peer -peer networking. This was an incredibly complex piece of software that carried the telltale fingerprints of careful engineering, quality assurance, and even the input of a legal team in setting its boundaries and behavior. The fact that the software was apparently the beneficiary of careful legal consideration led experts to assume a Western origin as Russian and Chinese hackers are generally less concerned with the collateral damage from their efforts. But perhaps most intriguingly, Stuxnet carried legitimate digital certificates signed by two well-known companies, J Micron and Realtek Semiconductor. These certificates are like digital IDs that tell your system that your software is trustworthy. How did the malware authors get their hands on these? It turned out the certificates were stolen, adding another layer of intrigue and pointing again towards a highly sophisticated operation. While most malware is designed to steal data, create botnets, or hold systems for ransom, Stuxnet had a different mission. As researchers continued their analysis, they realized that Stuxnet was specifically searching for systems running Siemens Step 7 software. Step 7 is used to program Programmable Logic Controllers, or PLCs, which are specialized computers that control industrial machinery. Now, PLCs are the workhorses of modern industry. They control everything from assembly lines and chemical reactions to power grids and operations. The PLCs are directly connected to the machines in the factory, and the PCs connect to the PLCs. But why would somebody go to such great lengths to target them? As the pieces came together, it became apparent that Stuxnet was designed to infiltrate industrial control systems, specifically those using certain models of Siemens PLCs connected to frequency converters from specific manufacturers. These frequency converters control the speed of motors, and in this case, the motors in question were part of gas centrifuges used for uranium enrichment. One of the challenges in attacking industrial control systems is that they're often isolated from the internet, a security measure known as an air gap. This is different than having a good firewall or a DMZ. It means there is no connection between the air gap systems and the outside world whatsoever. So how did Stuxnet reach these isolated systems? Well, the answer was both simple and clever. 
USB flash drives. Stuxnet was designed to spread via removable media. So when an unsuspecting employee or contractor plugged an infected USB drive into a workstation, even one not connected to the internet, the malware would spring into action. Stuxnet took advantage of the Windows Auto Run feature on removable drives, specifically targeting USB drives as a vector for spreading itself. Now, Auto Run is a feature that automatically executes a program called autorun.inf when a removable media, like a USB drive, is inserted. And by crafting a malicious autorun.inf file on infected USB drives, Stuxnet could automatically execute when the drive was inserted, spreading to the target system. In addition to using Autorun, Stuxnet also exploited a zero-day vulnerability in the way that Windows handled link or shortcut files. Even if Autorun was disabled, merely viewing the contents of an infected USB drive in the Windows Explorer could trigger the malicious link file, causing Stuxnet to run without any user interaction. Once Stuxnet executed on a machine, it used several privilege escalation vulnerabilities to gain administrative rights. From there, it could propagate through networks, infect other systems, and ultimately target specific industrial control systems. But Stuxnet didn't just indiscriminately infect every system it encountered. It had checks in place to identify if it was on the right network and connected to the specific PLCs that it was designed to target. If the conditions weren't met, Stuxnet would remain dormant, reducing the chance of detection. One of Stuxnet's most sophisticated features was its ability to perform a man-in-the-middle attack on the communication between the Siemens Step 7 software and the PLCs. It intercepted instructions sent from the control software to the PLCs and could modify them on the fly. When Stuxnet was first installed, it would merely collect data for the first 30 days. And then when the time came to initiate the attack, it would replay that recorded data and feed that false data back to the monitoring systems, not unlike a criminal in a heist movie putting a pre-recorded video loop over security camera footage. This misled operators into believing that everything was functioning normally, while the real malicious activity was happening unnoticed in the background, allowing the attack to proceed without triggering any alarms. So while the operators saw normal readings on their screens, the PLCs were executing malicious code designed to subtly alter the operation of the centrifuges. This deception was crucial because any abrupt changes or alarms might have triggered the engineers that something was amiss and perhaps initiate a shutdown before the damage could be done. So what did Stuxnet actually do once it had infiltrated the target system? Its payload was designed to manipulate the speed of the centrifuges in a very precise manner. Centrifuges are delicate pieces of advanced equipment that spin at incredibly high speeds, like tens of thousands of RPMs, to separate isotopes of uranium using centrifugal force. Stuxnet intermittently increased the rotation speed beyond the design limits, and then reduced it way back down to low to try and induce harmonics, and so on. This fluctuation caused excessive mechanical stress, leading to the degradation and eventual failure of the centrifuges. But here's the kicker. It did this while reporting normal operating conditions back to the monitoring systems. As far as the engineers could see, everything was running smoothly, even as their equipment was being compromised. This not only damaged the hardware, but also sowed confusion and mistrust within the facility, as operators couldn't pinpoint the cause of the failures and couldn't rely on their reporting data. Despite its targeted design, Stuxnet didn't stay confined just to its intended environment. Due to its propagation methods, it began spreading globally, infecting systems in countries like Indonesia, India, Azerbaijan, and eventually the United States. Estimates suggest that over 200,000 computers were infected. However, without the specific configuration of Siemens PLCs controlling centrifuges, Stuxnet remained largely inert in these systems. But its widespread presence increased the likelihood of detection, which is eventually what happened. And after Stuxnet's initial discovery, cybersecurity experts around the world began to collaborate in an unprecedented effort to dissect and understand this extremely complex worm. Firms like Symantec, Kaspersky Lab, and other leading cybersecurity organizations pooled their resources to reverse engineer the code. What they found was astonishing. The worm wasn't just sophisticated. It was a masterpiece of programming, utilizing multiple layers of encryption, obfuscation, and even a built-in update mechanism that allowed it to receive new instructions. Digging deeper, analysts discovered that Stuxnet carried legitimate digital certificates from two reputable companies, as we mentioned, J Micron and Realtek Semiconductor. These certificates are like digital passports that verify the authenticity of the software. Their presence allowed Stuxnet to appear as trusted code, bypassing many security measures. Investigations revealed that these certificates were likely stolen, hinting at a highly coordinated operation involving either physical theft or sophisticated cyber espionage. 
One of the most intriguing aspects was the worm's specific targeting. Statistical analyses showed that approximately 60% of the infected systems were located in Iran. This was a significant clue. Furthermore, Stuxnet was designed to seek out System Step 7 software running on systems connected to specific models of PLCs, particularly the Siemens S7-300 series. Even more specifically, it targeted PLCs connected to frequency converters from two manufacturers, Vacon based in Finland and Ferraro Paya based in Iran. These frequency converters control the speed of motors operating at frequencies between 807 Hz and 1210 Hz, a range uncommon in most industrial applications, but typical for gas centrifuges used in the uranium enrichment process. This level of specificity suggested that the creators had intimate knowledge of the target environment. As the international community became aware of Stuxnet's capabilities, speculation about its origins intensified. The media and experts proposed various theories. The most prevalent was that Stuxnet was a joint effort between the United States and Israel. Both nations had expressed deep concern over Iran's nuclear program, and the worm appeared to be a direct attack on that capability. The governments remained officially silent, neither confirming nor denying involvement, but anonymous sources and leaked information began to paint a clearer picture. Reports emerged that Iran's nuclear program had indeed suffered significant setbacks around the time that Stuxnet was active. The International Atomic Energy Agency noted unusual disruptions, and it was estimated that Stuxnet had destroyed up to 1,000 centrifuges at the Natanz uranium enrichment facility, representing about 10% of Iran's capacity. The worm caused the centrifuges to spin at damaging speeds while masking the activity from monitoring systems, leading to mechanical failures that puzzled Iranian engineers. In addition to the damage done, the Iranian enrichment process was largely halted across the country as their technicians scrambled to figure out the cause before more damage could occur. In June 2012, a groundbreaking article in the New York Times shed light on a covert operation known as Operation Olympic Games. According to anonymous officials, this was a cyber warfare initiative started under the Bush administration and accelerated under President Obama. The operation aimed to use cyber weapons to delay Iran's ability to develop nuclear weapons without resorting to traditional military action. Stuxnet was a central component of this strategy. The article revealed that the United States had built replicas of Iran's nuclear centrifuges to test the worm's effectiveness meticulously. This level of preparation underscored the sophistication of the operation and the lengths to which the involved parties went to ensure success while minimizing collateral damage. Stuxnet's revelation ignited intense debates over the ethical and legal implications of using cyber weapons. It was the first known instance of malware causing physical destruction of equipment, setting a worrying precedent for future conflicts. However, the ethical considerations have to be viewed in light of the alternatives like conventional assassination, something that was also happening in parallel. An Iranian nuclear scientist was killed and another severely injured when motorcycle-riding assassins attached a sticky bomb to their vehicle. This juxtaposition highlights the complex nature of modern warfare where cyber attacks, though less overtly violent, can still cause significant harm without direct loss of life. While cyber weapons like Stuxnet may be seen as less destructive options compared to traditional military strikes or targeted assassinations, they raise troubling questions about sovereignty, civilian collateral damage, and the potential for unintended consequences. The covert nature of cyber operations also blurs this accountability, making it harder to determine the rules of engagement and who bears responsibility when things go wrong, further complicating the ethical landscape of this new battlefield. The uncontrolled spread of the worm to systems outside its intended target raised concerns about collateral damage and the potential for retaliation. The importance of securing critical infrastructure became a top priority, leading into investments in better security measures for industrial control systems. And in response to the attack, Iran took significant steps to bolster its cybersecurity defenses. Reports indicated that the country began recruiting and training a cyber army to protect against future assaults and to possibly carry out its own cyber operations. Iran also became more secretive about its nuclear activities, limiting access and information sharing with international bodies. Globally, Stuxnet had far-reaching implications. It essentially sparked a cyber arms race with nations recognizing the strategic importance of offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. Governments around the world began developing policies and military doctrines related to cyber warfare, understanding that the battlefield had expanded into the digital realm. Following Stuxnet, other sophisticated malware like Dooku and Flame were discovered. These pieces of malware shared similarities with Stuxnet, suggesting that they were part of a larger family of cyber espionage tools possibly developed by the same actors. 
Dooku appeared to be designed for intelligence gathering, potentially to facilitate future attacks, while Flame was capable of extensive data collection and network surveillance. And by the end of this phase, it was clear that Stuxnet was not just an isolated incident, but part of a broader shift in how nations engage in covert operations. In the aftermath of Stuxnet's revelation, the world found itself at a crossroads. The attack had exposed a gaping vulnerability in the global infrastructure, one that could be exploited by anybody with the requisite knowledge and resources. Industries that had long considered themselves insulated from cyber threats realized that they were potential targets. The line between the digital and physical worlds had been blurred. Governments and corporations worldwide began to reassess their cybersecurity strategies. Critical infrastructure sectors like energy, transportation, and manufacturing recognized the urgent need to secure their industrial control systems. These systems, often running on outdated software and designed without security in mind, were now seen as liabilities. One of the immediate consequences was the acceleration of international efforts to establish norms and laws governing cyber warfare. Attacks like the 2015 Ukraine power grid hack and the 2017 WannaCry ransomware outbreak underscored the persistent and evolving nature of cyber threats. Each incident served as a reminder of the lessons first highlighted by Stuxnet. In reflecting on the journey we've taken through the story of Stuxnet, it's clear that this was more than an isolated incident. It was a pivotal moment to signal the shift in how conflicts could and would be waged and how nations interact on the global stage. The challenges it exposed are ones that we'll continue to grapple with for years to come. It's worth considering the lessons that Stuxnet has taught us. The fancy answer would be that vigilance in cybersecurity isn't just the domain of governments and large corporations. It's a cooperative endeavor. But I think the bigger lesson, the one that impresses me the most, is simply the lengths that talented people will go to in order to achieve a goal if they're given proper resources and incentives. Regardless of how you feel about Stuxnet itself, it has to be admired as an incredible technical achievement. Please remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I would be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Make sure you turn on notifications. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. And check out Dave's Attic channel for the Shop Talk episodes where we answer viewer questions and feedback. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.